In the first part of this series, I asked Professor Kevin Anderson at Manchester University whether he thought that climate change had actually been falling down the public agenda, and if so, why that might be. And he confirmed that he indeed thought that was the case, and he also gave some very interesting explanations as to why. In this second part of the series, I wanted to ask whether there was a personal role we could all play in tackling climate change because it's often a question I get asked or, or a comment that comes to me is that oh there's no point in me changing my lifestyle if there's huge polluting coal-fired power stations in China. So I asked Kevin what role we could play and wasn't this going to disadvantage people in the developing world if they had to take, make these personal sacrifices and yet hadn't had the kind of benefits that we've had? It's not about um, telling people, it's about telling a particular, small, vociferous, very high consuming group of people. And I have repeatedly made the point for at least 10 if not 15 years that I, see the, I want to see the energy consumption of the poor parts of the world rise, indeed including some of the people in our own country. I want to see their emissions go up in the short term as well, because they, that means they're burning fossil fuels which immediately will give them access to energy. That improves their quality of life. And that is compensated for by Nicola Stern, by myself and other people in the incredibly profligate end using part of our community, making substantial reductions in how we um, use energy and therefore that will affect how we live our lives. But it's not about people having to change their lives, it is about, a, in terms of mitigation, it is about a, particularly to start off with, it's about a, a, a small elite group which, which many of us who talk about climate change are actually in. Virtually every climate scientist, every climate academic, probably every single academic. You know, so the vociferous elite in our society, whether it's the barristers in the legal profession or whether it's the you know, academics, you know, we, are, we are in that group. And what we are talking about is really the foxes having to put in reinforcement on the chicken um, coop, which is quite challenging to imagine happening. And therefore the way around that is to, is to paint a softer picture, both to ourselves and to everyone else. Sorry, the foxes are strengthening the chicken coop. Well, I said we're the foxes, and okay. I mean, what I'm saying is, it's not a perfect uh, metaphor. But it's just the idea that we're, you know, we have to do something significant, and um, that is against our best interests. So the fox wants to get to the chickens, but uh, yeah, so we, we we have to protect the chickens in a sense. We in a sense we have to protect the poor people by making big changes to our own lifestyles, which mm. are challenging to do. Have a mechanism for for how you would um, tackle that issue of. of the global elite. I mean, is it? Well, I mean, initially, I think what you, I mean, I make this point repeatedly is that Should initially what you need is examples. Our own carbon budgets. Well, I mean, you could have a. There are not lots of ways, and what I don't want to do is say what is what should be used at the global level. I think actually, this is why I like the concept of carbon budgets. A carbon budget should be applied to a nation, and that could be done. I mean, that was a lot of horse trading doing that, but we could have, we could have done that in Paris. We could have had a global carbon budget, which then we could then could have discussed about how we apportion that out to nations. Once a nation's got its carbon budget, I think it's up to that country to decide what is the most, most culturally appropriate mechanism for that nation. So if some countries would prefer a tax, some people would prefer regulations, some people would prefer just a, you know, a, a, a direct diktat from on, on high. Um, so nations have their own cultural ways of dealing with issues. For me personally living in the UK, I think you know, one way to think about it is a personal carbon allowance. That, I'm not saying that's the only way we can think about it, and it would not be the only instrument, but I would think that is one option. Things like frequent flyer levies, and I mean actually exponential increases to the price of the flight, not just, a, not just an extra £10 on top. So you'd, you'd pay twice as much for your second flight, four times as much for your third flight, eight times as much for your fourth flight. It would be that sort of rate of increase. So that, and the benefit of that, it doesn't stop the poor people taking their occasional flights, which of course the rich want to blame for the expansion of the airports, but the, the numbers don't stack up again. Um, the other way, things like progressive metering tariffs. So in a house, the more we consume, the more you pay per unit. At the moment, the people who pay the most per unit are the poorest people with meters in their houses. Um, now, we have to be a bit careful about some of these instruments, particularly for households, because there's a significant chunk of people who are in the fuel poverty group who are also in such poor houses that they use quite a lot of energy to keep their houses even at very low levels of heat. So we have to be, we have to be aware of some of these equity concerns. So I think we have to, where again, wherever you look at these issues, you have to unpick what some of the neg negative repercussions could be. So I work quite a lot in Sweden at the moment, now you wouldn't have to worry about those houses there because they're all going to be reasonable quality houses. No one would be in fuel very, poverty in their houses. They're going to be very energy efficient. Yeah. But over here, of course, 
and we have really poor quality houses, which in the worst houses are the ones that the poorest live in, and they suffer all the bronchial problems and so forth. So we mustn't exacerbate those tent those problems. Um, so I think we have to, in the end of the day, we have to find some mechanism to force the wealthy in society, who are generally the high emitters, to change their emissions. One of the reasons I particularly like personal carbon allowances, though I can imagine it being politically, very, well, all of this would be very challenging, is that it, it forces the wealthy to, be, to drive the innovation process. The problem with the carbon tax is that the wealthy can always pay it. We're, all, we're, we're basically inelastic to the price of energy. We, we will just carry on consuming regardless of the price of energy. But the poor won't. The poor you know, are very elastic to it. They will have to change their behaviours. The benefit of personal carbon allowance is that we would have to change our behaviour. And we are the people that drive the innovation process. There's lots of repeated theory over decades about this. The early adopters are generally the relatively wealthy. And if you're forced to make some changes because of a carbon allowance, you're putting pressure on the innovation process to drive that. So there's a lot of benefits that play out of um, a personal carbon allowance in driving innovation. And, and would that carbon allowance, that personal carbon allowance, take into a into account things like diet, meat? No, I mean I personally I think it has to be kept quite simple to start off with. You have to do the things you, you have an accurate account of, so it would be your um, electricity and your any gas and fuel you use for your home, any fuel you buy for your car and probably things like flights. You may have to over time be able to put in things like some forms of public transport but it would be hard to imagine quite how it would work, say if you're getting on and off a bus and things like that. It could be achieved, it has to be done very simply um, and myself and some colleagues worked on this a long time ago, and David Miliband at the time was actually quite keen on this and actually asked DEFRA to look at it as a policy option. And DEFRA's response was it's a policy before its time. But I would argue that we've got to a point now that the rates of reduction we require to stick to the two degree C carbon budgets are such we should be revisiting all of these policy suites. Where, where is the messaging wrong? That um, to just, just how easy I think. They, they give the impression it can be done relatively easily. We need to move away from the um, from fossil fuels. Uh, you know, I, I think we need to do that and I think we can do it in line with the carbon budgets for just about two degrees centigrade. But I think to pretend that it's going to be a relatively straightforward shift I think is, is misleading. Um, you take a litre, a litre bottle and fill that with petrol. You know, it will get you a long, long run. It is safe, it burns relatively cleanly, um, other than the carbon dioxide and so forth. Um, it, you know, there's plenty of it, you can refill it quite quickly, it's very energy dense. To replace that with the alternatives you have at the moment is going to be very challenging indeed. And I think it begs more fundamental questions about what we do in our lives and how we live our lives. Because I do not think we'll have a one-for-one -one transformation, to, at least in the time frame we have to deal with climate change. Something like 80% of our energy consumption needs to be electric rather than 20%. The things we have to do now are not necessarily good from a sustainability perspective. Runway, Heathrow, shale gas, these are completely incompatible with Paris. All of that is a jobs agenda for the next 30 years.